Welcome back, geology fans. If you've been a faithful viewer and seen all our episodes up to this point, then I feel you are ready to start learning how to apply all this in the real world, or what we geologists call the field. Field geology is central to our science, as our principal laboratory is the worldly one. But this world changes through time, repositioning rocks in various ways, and we geologists come up to the results of those billions of years of changes and have to unravel what series of grand events took place there. The main way we do this is by identifying geologic structures in the field. Structures are the physical shapes produced after rocks have been subjected to various stresses. Once you have the ability to recognize these structures, you can use them to not only unravel the depositional history of an area, but also its stress history. Was the area pulled apart in the past, pushed together, or even sheared apart? Or maybe one then the other? We begin our discussion on structures by pointing out the difference between stress and strain. Stress is a force, but specific to structural geology, stress is the force applied over a volume of rock. There are three types of stress our information bomb rocks could be subjected to. Compression, pushing together tension, pulling apart, and shear, sliding in opposite directions or two oppositely directed forces across the rock. Thinking back to our episode on plate tectonics, convergent boundaries are generally dominated by compressive stress, divergent boundaries are dominated by tensional stress, and conservative or transform boundaries are dominated by shear stress. Basic silly putty can show us that we need to bring in another concept besides the magnitude of force to fully understand rock structures. Time. If we set up a column of silly putty and subject it to the compressive stress caused by gravity, it slowly deforms and even flows. But if I take the same lump of silly putty and compress it again, but rapidly with a hammer blow, we can actually see the silly putty break, fracture. Similarly, rocks can flow or fracture depending on temperature, pressure, composition, and the rate and magnitude of the stress applied. The way in which a rock deforms when it is subjected to a stress is called its strain. Like stress, strain has three forms. Brittle, breaking or fracturing. Ductile, flowing like plastic or thick fluid. And elastic, bending or deforming in some way with the stress, but if the stress is released, the rock will go back to its original shape with no permanent deformation. On a diagram plotting stress over strain, we see that a material will slightly deform strain as it is stressed, but if it fails with brittle strain, the stress is immediately released. If the failure is ductile, we see the material reach its yield point, that is enough stress that it begins to flow, and then continues to flow with increasing stress reaching its maximum strength level and further stress may cause brittle failure again. But note how the stress is maintained as the material deforms with ductile strain. Elastic strain would deform the material, but then send it right back to its starting position if the stress is released. One can see that most elastic strain occurs at lower stress levels, but as stress builds, either ductile or brittle strain deformation take over. Now we can combine types of stress and strain to produce a quick list of common geologic structures. First off, we note the general patterns. Elastic strain does not produce permanent structures, as once the stress is released, the rock goes back to its original form and does not preserve the elastic strain as a structure. Secondly, brittle deformations all cause what are known as faults, which are defined as breaks in the rock across which movement has occurred. Ductile strain produces folding with compression and boudinage with tension, and monoclinal folds with shear stress. The remainder of this episode will cover the brittle faults, and we start at the top left of our pundit square to see that when compressive stress causes brittle strain in a rock, the result is reverse faults in most cases, and in rarer cases of extreme stress, the lower angle thrust faults. As faults are generally planes of weakness, 
Hot fluids carrying valuable minerals can intrude into them, forming rich mineral veins. Miners through the ages have dug down along faults to pull out the ore material, and finding themselves on the fault, they coined the terms foot wall and hanging wall. The foot wall is under their feet, and the hanging wall is hanging over their heads. Every fault that is not perfectly vertical has a foot wall and a hanging wall, and it is by their relative motion that we know what type of fault we are looking at. All faults caused by compression, whether they be reverse or thrust faults, have their hanging wall go up relative to their foot wall. The difference between reverse and thrust faults is that thrust faults have a more shallow angle, closer to horizontal, and are caused by more intense and rapid compression. This is the surface expression of the Sevier thrust fault west of Las Vegas. Such thrust faults can cause slabs of surficial rock to move kilometers over the rocks below and cause one of the ways to break stratigraphic superposition by putting older and relatively undeformed rock layers on top of younger layers. If you see such a pattern, but the internal up indicators say nothing has been overturned, you should suspect a thrust fault at play. If you forget which way the hanging wall goes in a reverse or thrust fault, I suggest you use your hands to remember. Place your hands together, tilt them off vertical, and press them together with compressive stress. You will feel your upper hand, the hanging wall hand, moving up relative to your lower foot wall hand. Tilt your hands in the opposite direction and Note that when you compress them together, the upper hand, now on the other side, still goes up. It doesn't matter which way the fault tilts. As long as you have compressive stress, the hanging wall will go up relative to the foot wall. But what if you pull your hands apart, trying to keep them in contact with each other? Feel the way your upper hanging wall hand now goes down relative to the lower foot wall hand? Again, it doesn't matter which way the hands are tilted, the upper hanging wall hand always goes down with tensional stress relative to the foot wall. This opposite of reverse fault movement is called a normal fault, and can result in a landscape known as Horst and Graben topography, which translates from the German roots to nest, Horst, and grave, Graben topography. If we take a flat landscape and pull it apart with brittle strain, faults will form and begin to oppose each other at certain distances, allowing a block to slide downward, each side being the hanging wall of its bounding faults, to form a, a down-dropped graben, while the blocks remaining in the higher position form the horsts. Standing on the edge of the Colorado National Monument, you're on a high-standing horst, looking across a graben valley to the next distant horst. As we follow the East Pacific Rift north, we see it dive below North America and ripping Baja, California away from Mexico on the way, but that rift disappears below North America in the western United States, and that divergent ridge, causing tensional stress, has fractured Nevada, or the area known as the Basin and Range, into a series of normally faulted horsts and grobbins. So to review, reverse and thrust faults have the hanging wall go up relative to foot wall, with thrust faults at a lower angle going farther distance, and the normal faults have the hanging wall go down relative to the foot wall. Our last stress produces our last fault type in the brittle strain column, the strike-slip fault. Regardless of the tilt of the fault from the surface, and many of these are nearly vertical, there is no relative motion of hanging wall and foot wall, upward or downward, for the pure strike-slip fault. Only side-to-side -side motion. Strike-slip faults are most obvious when they express themselves at the surface, and recall that breaks on faults can cause earthquakes, by which we can tell that some faults are blind faults, meaning they never make it to the surface, and thus we are blind to them until they cause an earthquake. Strike-slip faults at the surface can cause a long linear scar across which offset streams get slowly distorted. Looking at an offset stream can let one know the direction of movement on a strike-slip fault, which comes in two flavors. Right lateral, where no matter which side of the fault you stand on, you see the other side move to your right. Or left lateral, where the opposite side always goes to your left. 
The San Andreas Fault in California is a right lateral strike slip fault slowly moving Los Angeles up towards San Francisco. But the San Andreas is not perfectly straight, and where it bends, we can see the land have a bit more tension and pull apart in an isolated basin called a sag pond. Or if it bends the other way, it can cause more compression and minor mountain building. So offset streams, sag ponds, and minor uplift are all associated with these strike-slip faults. Let's pause and practice before we move on. What kind of fault is this? Reverse or normal? What kind of stress produced it? And what kind of strain? Here are some choices for you. Feel free to pause the image and take your time, but we will get the answer when this five-second clock counts down. This is a normal fault, with the hanging wall going down relative to the foot wall, and it is caused by tensional stress with brittle strain. Okay, try this one. This is a reverse fault, with a hanging wall going up relative to the foot wall, and it is caused by compressional stress with brittle strain. And this? This is a right lateral strike slip fault, with the other side from you always moving to your right when you face the fault, and it is caused by sheer stress. And I hope you're getting it drilled into your head that all faults are the result of brittle strain. I also hope you note that you can never get a normal fault with compression or a reverse fault with tension, and neither can be made by ductile nor elastic strain, as all faults are due to brittle strain. All right, what kind of fault is this? And here I'll guess that most of you just answered that this is a right lateral strike slip fault due to sheer stress, brittle strain, but stop for a moment and think about the full three-dimensional picture. These beds are dipping away, and though it looks like the distant side moved to the right of the foreground, making this look like a right lateral strike slip fault, the same pattern could be made if the back were lifted up relative to the front, and, and then eroded back down to a level plane. If that is the case, we don't know at all what kind of fault this is, as it depends on the direction the brake dips into the ground. It could be normal, reversed, or maybe it really is strike-slip. This is why strike-slip faults are sometimes called the fault of the confused geologist. Y you think you found a strike-slip fault? Well, do take some time to consider if you've thought out all the ways it could have moved to form what you see before you. But not all hope is lost if you're not sure about past movements at first glance. We can look at these scraped and often polished rock surfaces called slicken sides. If we find them in place, we can look at the slicken sides and get a notion of the motion. First off, looking at the lineations, we can narrow down the movement to one of two directions. Secondly, we can look more closely at the slicken sides and perhaps see stair-step features along them to get the exact direction of movement. If you follow these stair steps up, that is in the direction that particular rock wall moved. In other words, as a rock face scrapes along another rock face, each side makes downward steps in the opposite wall. If we had good slicken sides, this fault would not confuse us as it has. We might be able to better fix it in our pundit square as a normal reverse or strike-slip fault. But nature doesn't like to be pigeonholed and often throws more than one type of stress at a rock formation. Now, it's impossible to throw both compression and tension at a rock formation simultaneously as they are opposite to each other. But you can combine either with shear to produce a variety of what are known as oblique slip faults. With tension, you get normal oblique slip faults, and with compression, you get reverse oblique slip faults. 
A last note on faults for this episode is that we've been giving examples of faults that are rather planar. And thus, when they intersect another plane, like a rock face, they appear linear. But many faults bend with depth and are not perfectly linear. And also, faults occur within wide zones rather than along narrow planes. Commonly, fault zones have seriously deformed rock in them uh, and result in fault melange and fault breccia. Recall that breccia is the term for angular rock fragments glued together, and one can imagine the formation of a fault could form solid rock into fault breccia. When we come back next time, we will finish off our structural chart to see what ductile strain can produce with compression, tension, and shear, and finish off with a structure called joints, seen in more mildly stressed rocks. And I hope you remain only mildly stressed until next time here on Earth Explorations.